Hello, and welcome to all of my students, near and far, wherever you are. I would like to just say welcome to the uh, Professor Williams Show, okay? So listen, I would like to bring to you today, chapter 16. Chapter 16 is about the infant, okay? Um, so we're going to dash on in here and give you a few little highlights and pediatrics on the infant. So let's start with what their vital signs are when they are within normal limits. Would you like that? I thought you would. So let's talk about it. So now uh, for the average infant, respirations should be around 40 breaths per minute, okay? Their pulse rate is between 100 and 118 by the time that they are one years old. Their temperature, which should be taking, taken ancillary, okay, should be within a normal regular range, you know, 96, 98. Their blood pressure should be like 90 over 60 by the time that they are one years of age. Now, of course, we're not talking about these newborns who first came out. You know, they heart rate be thumping, baby, but that's not who we talking about. Please make sure that you guys are doing your homework. Your homework is to help elevate you, child, not to give you busy work, because who do that? Not me, not me. So you are to look up the objectives that is at the very front of your chapter. You have no idea how greatly that would help you, not only in passing this course, but in understanding and passing your NCLEX, okay? So that is very important. Now let's talk about some of the milestones that we have when we are dealing with infants, all right? Now, um, there are general patterns of achievement at various age. You guys... We're missing one thing. Y'all know. What are we missing? What are we missing? What, what are we missing? Y'all already know. Y'all already know. Y'all got me sitting up here squinching at this doggone paper. Child, be saying words that ain't on the page. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So, let's talk about the milestones. There's some general patterns of achievement at various stages. Often, these are referred to as norms. Nurses must understand that normal range for milestone achievements. You must know what they are so that when you are um, stating something is normal or abnormal, you must know what is the norm uh, variances that we are looking at. But hey, let's be 100% honest. Every baby does not fall within the standard norm, and that's okay. Uh, we just have to chart and grade where their uh, milestones are happening. So, uh, we want to understand what their established uh, establishment of sleep and wake cycles are. As you know, it starts changing from the time that they are a newborn all the way up until they are infant. This changes. Also, social smiling. Now, we're not talking about the smiles of uh, gas. <laughs> we're not talking about the smile um, that, you know, they're smiling in their sleep and things like that, even though that's super cute, uber cute, uber cute. We're talking about social smiling. Social smiling is when um, you're speaking to the child and you're smiling at the child and then they start smiling back. That is social smiling. Drinking from a cup, drinking from a cup, a sippy cup and separation anxiety. So let's go and talk about when we note these things to happen. All right? 
Y'all, I got a baby in my lap. Y'all want to see? Got a baby in my lap. You know, this baby is for the um, lecture. Now, yeah, we going to call you. Let me see what you look like. Do you look like a, you look like a Timothy. We're going to call him Timothy, okay? So Timothy is here for the lecture, all right? Because we might need to use Timothy to show y'all a few things. Now, let's talk about when we are um, <clears throat> seeing some of these milestones. Now remember, milestones of growth and development uh, describe general patterns of achievement at various stages of infancy. These milestones or patterns are referred to as norms, but make sure you remember, like I said, norms can greatly vary. Okay, they can greatly vary. Now, I have not seen or know of a child who did not do something different at one of these stages. So, let's talk about the establishment of the sleep-wake cycles. Um, these, these little people will also get feeding preferences. Um, they will have some social interactions that can occur during infancy that are things of cognitive and emotional development that will also continue throughout their little lives. By the time the infant is about four to six months, yeah, the positive uh, parental interaction with the infant should be obvious during the clinical visits. We should start seeing that they are interacting well together. Now, during the neonatal phase of development, the chief task mastered are the establishment of things like feeding patterns and sleep and wake patterns. Infants who have unmet hunger needs can become very irritable. They not um, perceive feedings as pleasurable. They don't want to do it. They're going to be screaming and they may fail to develop trust with their caregiver. Now, when we're talking about separation anxiety, please make sure that you refer to chapter 21. And this can be experienced and expected by the time someone is nine months old. You can notice that they're having some separation anxiety um, patterns or things starting to show up. Now, I want you guys to please make sure that you note in your objectives, pay attention to things like when does the infant begin to smile? When can an infant um, drink or hold their own cup? And also describe what some of the social anxieties and separation anxieties can uh, look like. Now let's go ahead and move on and talk about the oral stage. Oral stage is when the sucking begins and it brings comfort and relief to tension for these newborns. It is important to hold the infant during their feeding and allow sufficient time for the infant to um, suck the uh, bottle. Uh, infants on IV fluids or some kind of nutritional need additive they will need to use a pacifier. We give them a pacifier during their feedings, even if it's the NG tube or anything like that, so that they can get the satisfaction of understanding the fullness that they feel in their stomach. They will get that from the suckle effect so that when we do start to feed them properly, um, then they will identify that with the feeling of fullness. When an infant are able to use their hands more skillfully, they will gradually derive pleasure and comfort from other sources, things that they are doing with their hands. Like sometimes they'll want to hold their bottle. They'll hold their bink, okay? When sucking brings an infant comfort and relief from tension, this is something that will soothe them and calm them down. Now they'll understand that to gain nourishment, that they will also be comforted. 
Now, non-nutritional sucking, please remember that this is when we give them a pacifier, possibly when we are trying to comfort them or when we are trying to uh, feed them through uh, their nasal gastric tube. Now we're gonna move on to their motor development, like grasping reflex. Uh, this gasping reflex will disappear around three months of age, okay? Um, prehensions occur around five to six months of age and follow an orderly sequence of development. Then we note the parachute reflex. The parachute reflex appears around like seven to nine months as a, a protective mechanism. Now, that is when they would throw their arms out uh, as they are being thrust downward. It is a protective arm tension. So it kind of looks like this. So y'all, oh, my book to fail. So now y'all see his arms is parachuted out. So like when they are thrust down, they normally parachute their arms out to look so, like so. They will also have this little pincher they will have the pincher grass that's well established by one year of age. So uh, they will start doing things like pinching at things or pinching you, you know. And this is a, a coordinating the index finger with the thumb and start this pinching. So sometimes when a uh, child starts learning how to do this um, with this motor skill, the family is like, stop pinching me. Like, don't pinch me. They have no idea that the child is just very fascinated in the thought that they can put that together and like grasp, like pinch something. Now let's move on to emotional development. Now, each day, the infant becomes very impressed by actions and people that are around them. And they will begin to imitate because they trust the caregiver. Infants who are consistently picked up in response to crying, they show fewer crying episodes. And they have less aggressive behaviors at the age of two. Now, when an infant shows readiness, it is the parent's role to just encourage the readiness. Now, let me break down a little bit of what all I've said. Now, consistency must be established to develop trust, which is very vital in the development of a healthy personality. So, when I cry, I am the infant. When I cry and you come to me every time I cry, that is some consistency that you're showing me that you will always tend to my needs, okay? And then I will become a healthier adult without those personality issues of, you know, I could, there, there's no consistency. I could do this and then I might get that and then I could do the same thing and I might not get it, you know? Children will start to develop this in their personalities. Infants who are consistently picked up when they are crying, they have fewer crying episodes and they are less uh, aggressive in behavior. So the whole thought process of letting the baby cry, not picking the baby up every time they cry, that is incorrect. That is incorrect. When you have a newborn, an, an infant, and they are crying, you know, and you pick them up, you're just soothing them and showing them that they are protected and everything is going to be okay. Um, and then it fixes it for them where they will not have aggressive behaviors um, once they're two. Because all that is, is basically them trying to figure out how to get their needs met. That's why they will do things like tantrum and scream and holler and be aggressive and hit uh, because they are trying to get some type of a reaction. Infants will easily accomplish various activities if they are not forced before they reach readiness. So when they start showing signs uh, that they're ready to do things, it's not the parent's goal really to like force it or um, uh, give them ultimatums if they don't do it. It is the parent's goal to um, make some healthy encouragements. When infants show readiness to learn a task, just encourage. Now, the need of constant care and guidance. 
Now, the sensory stimulation is essential for the development of the infant throughout the process and the perceptual abilities. A crying child should be soothed. Yes, they should. If an infant appears hungry, do not delay the feeding in order to adhere to a, a routine. They're hungry. Yes, you want to keep it as close to the routine, but they're going to naturally do that. Don't hold off feedings because it hasn't been three hours yet. It's been two hours and 30 minutes. Like, don't hold off. An infant can recognize warm and affection or the lack thereof. So, you know how sometimes the infant will um, uh, want certain people? Or they tend to gravitate to certain people? It's because of how they feel, you know. They these these little people are very much about just what they feel. They don't know how to express anything else, so they can feel a warmth and a loving, inviting, you know, person. They can also feel very negative emotions. Now, coping with an irritable infant. Now, y'all, we have all had some irritable infants in our lives and in our homes. And they are not as difficult to deal with as one would believe. Whether they're irritated or lethargic, many of the same interventions can be used. An irritable infant the baby may cry and may be difficult to soothe. A lethargic baby may just shut down and sleep to avoid excessive stimulating a loud or a noisy environment. Um, so when you have a irritable baby and we cannot figure how to soothe them, sometimes we have learned that just an even, small, protected rocking motion will help. You know, we've also learned quiet will help. You know, we've also learned a soothing sound might help. Okay? Just you remaining calm when you are soothing the baby will help okay now then we have these lethargic babies these lethargic babies who they so over it child they are so over everybody around them because let's face it some of them were born into a mess um they may shut down they may not eat well because they're sleeping all the time because they're trying to avoid excessive uh loud noises okay now make sure also that when you are out, you are shielding the baby's eyes from all this sunlight and bright lights because bright lights also irritate babies. So, you know, you will see people, even on social medias, you will see people with their camera phones with the flashes on right in the baby's face. Um, and then they're wondering why the baby's screaming because, you know, they're trying to uh, put the filter on them so that they can uh, video them. So you have to educate that a bright light will still irritate the infant. Also, we know that cuddling and uh, swaddling will help the, um, the irritable infant. And uh, also a pacifier, maybe some non-nutritional sucking will help the infant. Now, if we notice that this baby is being lethargic, some infants will respond to excessive stimulating environments by just shutting down and sleeping. So if they, if we know that, we want to teach them, hey, decrease all the stimulation, decrease this noise, decrease these bright lights. Talk to the baby calmly. Some of that, oh my God, oh, to the baby, like that's not, that's not helpful. Not, not, not when, you know, you could be irritating the crap out of them with that voice. Um, sit the baby upright and slowly make maneuvers or slowly dress and undress the baby, all right? Now, 
we want to make sure that we are trying to develop some healthy sleeping patterns uh, when it comes to the baby. So now newborns will sleep in about four hour intervals, but by four to six months, they can be up to for like eight, eight hours at a time. They're looking at you. He looks at you. <laughs> Y'all know that song? <laughs> and that's a fact. That is a fact. Um, so we always want to make sure that we're synchronizing their um, a circadian rhythm of the infant to the family's routine uh, because this is a very learned behavior. Positions, uh, we want to make sure that the infant is laying on their back, you know, and on a firm mattress. And, they, you know, they changed this periodically back when I was having my children. It was like, you know, they, everybody was buying these little sideline things where you put them in like this little uh, taco so that they could stay on their sides. You know, and um, then we started the whole back to sleep initiative that I think works very, very well. Uh, infants rely on parents to soothe them back to sleep if they wake up during the night. There, there is no, oh, they'll just lay in there and take themselves to sleep. No, they're relying on you to help them get back to sleep, like assist them in soothing. You know, do soothing behaviors like um, a, a nice little warm, like, lavender bath will help. Talking to them quietly, maybe feeding them, you know, giving them a little full belly and making sure that you burp them and sit them upright for a while so that they can digest well. Things like that will also help. And we want to make sure that when we are putting our children to sleep, we're putting them in the best situation possible, like in a bed, on a, a firm mattress, you know, or if you're if they're going to be held while they sleep and you are awake because you guys are out somewhere, you make sure that you hold them upright. It is not good for people to try to just put infants in car seats and then let them sleep that way because then their chins are now. Now, if you put your chin down right now, how well are you breathing? You not. How so how do you think they breathing? They're not breathing well in these car seats and you got them in there, you thinking that they sleep and they head their chin is down. In car seats, their chin should always be up. Why? Why? Yeah. They need to breathe. Extend their necks. Don't pinch off. Okay? That's why it's very important that they are in an appropriate size car seat and that they're in these car seats appropriately. Now let's talk about illness prevention. Parents need to be educated on illness prevention. We need to make sure that they understand that the child has to have periodic health checks, that we need to ensure that infants receive their vaccinations at appropriate time, uh, provide education and anticipatory guides for the family member about developmental stages so that they know what they're looking for and what they should be expecting. We also want to stress the importance that you cannot spoil um, these babies, okay? And how important it is to change these diapers very, very often if they are wet or if they are soiled because these uh, the diaper rashes will cause way, way more damage and harm uh, and make the baby feel really bad and irritable with those sores on the bottom. Uh, we also want to educate them that we're going to monitor the growth of the baby. Uh, and the growth and the health of this baby must be documented and measured on a growth chart so we can see um, if they are continuing to move up within their age range or if we're having a problem and we're noting a decline or a stagnation. Now, this is how the nurse can educate the parent regarding skin care for the infant who has a diaper rash. We must <clears throat> not just say, hey, your baby has a diaper rash, go get the um, butt cream. They, they could still be doing it wrong. You have to educate. Make sure that you're changing the diaper often. Make sure that you are cleaning the baby from front to back. Make sure that it is clean and dry before you are putting any of this uh, ointments or anything like that on, then you will put the diaper on the child. And then you will repeat the cycle as often as necessary. 
also at these physical examinations um, the in the clinic setting at least five times in the first year the baby will need to be seen now the baby will have things like the tearing checked uh, things like that at the hospital but then they will have that check done again later as far as an assessment they will get their vision assessed as indicated um, we will do different screenings for the baby as necessary and like i told you the growth grid and developmental screenings must be done properly uh, nutritional counseling now here's a very important part when you are doing nutritional counseling because there's a lot of misconceptions on what should be given when it should be given who can eat what you know the first thing that someone wants to do is come ask you about this two-month-old baby if they can start feeding its cereal and its milk in the bottle the answer is no okay but the only reason they believe these kind of things is because they've heard it or because other people that they know have done it so we have to make sure that we are doing a lot of educational ed, um, instruction because what we are noting now is that a lot of these allergies because now child some of these children out here they they are uh, allergic to um air child they are allergic to everything and we have noticed that sometimes not all the time this is not a general question that goes across every board okay so don't come for me but what they are noticing these allergen these allergy doctors are saying that it's because some of these kids have been introduced to things way too soon so then their bodies didn't understand what it was and then they built up they built up an immunity to it uh, which is what that allergy looks like okay now, also, we want to make sure that we don't just provide education to the family. We want to also make sure that we give them some explanation because sometimes if you say, don't do this, for example, don't lay your baby. Let me say another one. Don't feed your baby solid food, even though your baby acts like they want to eat solid food. If you just say that, they're going to be like, mm, it's because they're not culturally diverse. They're not where I'm from. They don't know this or that. But if you say, don't feed your baby solid foods as of yet because their digestive system can't handle it. And because we could be setting up, setting them up for more allergies later, it's not too much longer. Let's just wait until they get to this approximate age, and then we can start. You're going to have more success than just saying don't. Um, now, we want to make sure that when we're providing the uh, education and explanation that we can back it up. We know why, and we can give them the proper why. Now, let's talk about bottle versus breastfeeding. Now, it may be helpful to review specific topics in this area, including how to heat up formula and how to determine if the infant is getting enough to eat based on the number of wet diapers and ability uh, of the infant to sleep and so on and so forth. But I'm really going to just give you guys just a little blip. There is no wrong way to feed your baby. And we don't do feeding shaming up around these parts, okay? Yes, what we like to say breast is best, we do. But can every mother breastfeed their baby? They cannot. Should should every mama breastfeed their baby? They should not. I see it what I see it. And I'm going to tell you why I see it what I see it. It is a proven fact that if you are not putting nutritional value in your body and then you are attempting to breastfeed, what are you giving this child? Correct. Absolutely nothing. If you are smoking and drinking and doing all these kind of things, should you be giving that to your child? Your child didn't ask to party. Your child asked to be fed. Exactly. So, you know, do what you do. Okay? But I'm just saying, we need to make sure that these babies are getting some nutritional values when they are feeding so it is a personal decision if you can breastfeed or bottle feed and no one should be shamed for the uh decision okay 
everybody must do what they need to do correctly in order to take care of the baby so if it's bottle feeding hooray let's bottle feed let's make sure that we teach about making sure though how to warm the bottles correctly how to check the temperature correctly how to feed the baby sitting up correctly and things like that now side note When you're teaching a mom, we teach her that she don't feed her baby like this. Why? That first of all, this is not helping his digestion. He's going to choke and he's going to have all these issues. Why do we like to feed our baby sitting up? We're going to feed our baby sitting straight up so that we can assist in digestion, okay? So we can help peristalsis go down. All right, that's why we're doing it. All right, and we also teach our little mamas that we don't do this. How many of y'all have seen this? We're going to just prop this bottle up. Poor little Timothy. We like to teach and educate that we don't do that as well. And then we're going to sit this baby up and we're going to burp this baby. And we're going to keep this baby up just for a little while, okay, so that we can assist peristalsis and help them digest properly, all right? That is a very important part of feeding your baby. We also will teach them, because uh, the mothers may pump, uh, the breastfeeding mothers may pump, and then freeze their milks. So we're going to also want to teach them how to warm their milk up properly so that we don't destroy all of the good nutrients in their milk. Now, let's talk about infant and their uh, that are special needs. Now, early detection is very, very important when we're dealing with an infant who has special needs because the best outcome can be attained the earlier that we start doing interventions and making goals for these particular babies. The mom may need a lot of reinforcement, some social services, some community help, some uh, family. She's going to need a, her tribe around her to help her. Now, early therapies can be done very early, like speech therapy, uh, neurodevelopmental therapy, and cognitive therapy can be done for these babies. Now, we're going to move on to immunizations in which we have already spoke a little bit about, and but we want to stress that repeated, um, repeating the importance of immunization and the timing of administering them are very, very important. We have a whole batch of um, human beings um, right now who did not get all of their immunizations and also if you really pay attention to the CDC's you will see that there is some increase in things like smallpox and then I really hate the argument when people say I thought smallpox was eradicated Maybe like Covisha, like COVID once it's here, it's here. It's not like it just gets to disappear. The only reason that you weren't seeing it in such great numbers anymore is because people were being immunized. So now they're not, some of them are not, which is why the numbers have gone up slightly. Okay, now delaying and starting them on their immunizations can lead to an increased risk of serious illness or even death. And according to to the CDC, some of these numbers of these illnesses have been going up amongst the very young and the very old. Accurate records of immunizations received will prevent confusion and duplication of them getting um, these um, injections as people move around and go from doctor to doctor. Now, you will notice that some of these grown people, we ask for a shot record and they have no idea. They don't know where it is. Their mama ain't never kept no shot record. All kinds of stuff. They know the pediatrician didn't die, child. They don't know where it is. So we try to teach our moms now. Listen, it is important that you keep up with the shot record of your child so that when you go from place to place or school district to school district, you have the proper paperwork so that they're not trying to make you get your baby re immunized for things that you know that they've already had. Some places have it where if they were seen in a, um, like a government establishment, like a um, Fresh Start program, you know, or um, if the mom was like um, 
is some program through the child's Medicaid, then the government, the there's a government entity that could have kept up with some of that, but that does not happen all the time. Okay, now nutritional counseling. Solid foods can slowly be added to the child like around six months but we're not talking about they can hold the french fries or give it to them that's not what we're talking about we're talking about things that have nutritional value the um they will stop with that tongue ex uh, extrusion reflex this has completely disappeared so it is easier for them and their gi tract is more um mature so that it can handle and digest foods between the ages of four months to six months, sucking is more mature and uh, munching or an up and down chewing or chomping motion will ensue. That's why y'all see those babies start chewing on those nipples, right? Now, determining adequacy of the diet, here's the thing that nurses should chart and note when they are in these clinics and noting these babies. The infant has gained about four to seven ounces per week uh, for like the first six months of their life. So when you are weighing this child, you are making sure that you get it on that graph and you're charting it appropriately so that we can see if the gradient is going up and they're staying within their age population. The infant has at least six weights diapers per day, then we know that they're being adequately, um, um, they're being, they're be, they're getting adequate nutrition. So I was trying to say, y'all, it was taking a minute for it to get out. That's what we're looking for. Some of the moms who are breastfeeding, of course, they can't measure how much milk their babies are getting if they're solely breastfeeding and not pumping into a bottle. So we like to teach them just like, you know, a regular formula fed baby. You know, if uh, they have at least six wet diapers a day, they are getting the proper nutrition. Okay, the infant sleeps peacefully for several hours after feeding also shows that they are having a, um, a adequate feeding. Please refer to table 16-3 in your textbook for details and information on the various formulas and the nutritional components within those formulas. Now, human milk, we say, you know, we just discussed that breast is best for infants younger than six months and formulas that are cow milk based and iron fortified can be recommended by the AAP. Now whole milk from a cow should not be given until after one years of age. But I'm gonna put a little side note in here. It ain't gonna be on no test, but I'm just gonna say cow milk is milk for cows, but okay, I, I see it in and I'm over that. Okay. Um so that's that. Now, there are some absolute contraindications in breastfeeding. So, you know, like I said, we don't, we don't feed shame around here. And some mothers can breastfeed and some mothers can't. And there could be a whole host of reasons on why she cannot. And I did mention one, but there could be a whole bunch of other stuff. Like, you know, the mother, what if the mother is HIV positive? What if the mother is on chemotherapy? What if she has um, philokinteria? What if she has um, uh, drugs in her system? Uh, what if she has untreated pulmonary tuberculosis? She don't need to be breastfeeding. Uh, galactosemia should not be breastfeeding. All right? Now, prebiotics and po probiotics for children are also very, very important. But let's talk about what the prebiotics uh, are and what probiotics are. Prebiotics are non-digestible food ingredients. This is an indirect stimulation of growth or activity of a microorganism, okay? And it assures balance of bacteria is maintained in the gut. That is the pre Biotic. That is what it does. Now, a, pro, a probiotic, this protects the GI tract. And also, a probiotic is used to treat diarrhea. Now, you will note prebiotics and probiotics that we all should be receiving. Now, we're going to move a little bit more, talk about some 
things that are safe for bottle feeding, you know, like um, making sure your bottles are clean, making sure not only that the bottles are clean, but that um, you have um, boiled the bottles or sterilized the bottles, all right? Also, we want to make sure that we teach them to never put that formula, those bottles in the microwave. You're going to have hot spots. You're going to destroy the bottle and chemicals from the plastic that uh, that the bottle is made out of then ends up inside the formula okay so we want to teach them to just kind of drop that bottle into some warm water and let it warm up that way all right which means you have to be ready for the feeding you can't do that right when the baby starts screaming that it's hungry also we want to uh teach them that they should not save formula do not feed a baby a bottle that you have made and it's been sitting out for several hours. Do not save formula that is left from an old feeding. This can give your baby diarrhea, all right? So I always like to teach the moms, you know, you feed the baby from this bottle, an uh, hour uh, has gone by or so, you need to throw that bottle out and clean it and start fresh, all right? Um, always use clean containers to mix and store the baby's formula in. Use the formula as instructed. Mix it as instructed. And always check the container for the expiration dates. We want to also teach them to do things like we were speaking. Avoid um, um, feeding them solids too fast. And when you are adding solid foods, do not introduce a new food if the infant is already sick or if the infant has shown an allergy to something like it, don't give it to them. Um, it may not be very appropriate. Rice cereal is always recommended as the first food because it is the most easily digest, okay? Do not mix the cereal or baby food in the bottle with the formula. Why do people do that? Like, say, okay, I'm just checking and, uh, and, not, and not educated on not doing that. You know why? Because they've seen it done. People do things like that because they don't know any better. Uh, they feel like, hey, that's why well, somebody taught them and, you know, it, it makes the baby go to sleep and all these kinds of things. But we want to teach them appropriate feedback eating techniques you will fix their cereal like you fix anybody else's cereal and you will feed them with a spoon <laughs> and then their bottle will just be the regular formula or their breast milk okay we do not mix it only introduce one food at a time and when you do you introduce it in a very small amount and then you pay attention you observe the baby um you don't just uh say okay they're gonna have sunday dinner and it's the first time they've eaten anything. Are you giving them several things to try? Because then if they have an allergic reaction, you don't know what did it. All right? Delay introducing uh, introductions of food with known allergic causes or responses. So we're going to avoid giving them orange juice very early on. Avoid giving them milk and nuts and strawberries and chocolate and egg whites very early on until their bodies can build up some, you know, some health and some immunity. Now it is um, encouraged, there is a recommendation of fat intake during infancy um just like how um they need fat in their diet because we need fat in our diet but we be doing too much fat in our diet child but we don't want to do too much fat in their diet infants require almost three times more calories per day than the human being that is an adult does but that still we have to watch to make sure we don't overfeed them and easily uh digestible fats are needed for the growth and development of their brain child we need those healthy fats for brain development by age six months the digestive tract has the ability to digest food uh that is present that is uh in their system without any difficulty and a well-balanced diet provides appropriate fat and caloric uh, cholesterol intake a low-fat diet should not be given to infants younger than two years of age because why because their brain is developing that's right and we really really need that they need essential fats so please read and note what are the essential fats that these children do need please make sure that you note the development feeding uh skills like between four to six months of age their sucking is more mature they will have that munching you know that chopping up and down 
Now let's talk about weaning. Now weaning, now everybody has their own thoughts on weaning and when people should wean a baby and all that. But there is signs of readiness of weaning. So things like the infant is eagerly looking forward to uh, new tastes and textures that they want on a spoon. <laughs> That's when we should be like weaning them, okay? Um, they may not want to be held close to them during a feeding because they trying to eat on their own. You know, those are signs of uh, weaning themselves. They may start to bite the nipple as they get teeth. That is not for you to pop them. They are just showing you that there's signs that they are being ready to be weaned. And they may imitate parents and or siblings when they are eating that's another sign that they are really ready to be weaned and weaning should be gradual all right they should start with daytime weanings and then move on to the progression of night you will never ever in the township of ever take the nighttime feeding first because that's when they're really trying to be soothed so that they can calm themselves so that they can go to bed now let's talk about organic and or natural foods. Now these foods do not contain any additives. They because they are guidelined by very very strict protocols of things like fertilizers and soils and herbicides and pesticides and all of that. And if animals, there's no drugs or hormones used in animals before processing if it's called organic or natural. The uh, nutritive value has been shown by evidence-based research to be superior to non-organic foods. So we would like to stress the importance of reading food labels. Now, I know that this is a very, very hard thing for some people because maybe money is a thing. And I do understand that it can be very, very pricey to feed people uh, natural or uh, organic food. But I just put that little slide in to say when we are feeding children, the more nutrient-dense um foods we can give them the more nutrients that is in the food the better it is for their little bodies okay so things that are not nutrient don't have a lot of nutrients in it do not give the children much to work with all right so there's some recommendations for increasing solid food intake that we're going to talk about like new foods should not uh, should be only introduced what one at a time should not be introduced when the child is sick um also, I want to say fruit juices can be given around five to six months of age. Stop giving these. Now, okay, hold on. Let's talk about it. Fruit juices. And I mean, it is derived from the fruit. Okay. I don't mean uh, red Kool-Aid. And we say it's strawberry. That's not what we're talking about. That's not good for them. Okay, um, because then we're introducing all that sugar into their bodies when we're giving them these false fruit drinks. Um, it's really not good for them. When the infant begins to drink from a cup, that's when we should be trying to give them juices. We all of these babies with these with this juice in these bottles, and baby, they drinking twelve ounces of uh, fake apple juice. That's not good. That's not okay. We want to delay things like orange juice until they are about one year old, okay? And um, other foods that we're going to delay to their older, you know, some ones that I also said that we know may have some kind of a, they may have an allergic reaction to is things like strawberries and nuts and fish and things like that, okay? We talked about rice uh being the first solid because it gives them it's easily digested it has less of an allergic uh, reaction to it we want to offer them a small amount like a one teaspoon we want to place it on the back of the infant's tongue the amounts of solid food should be gradually increased and the type should be gradually increased and we're only going to introduce how many at a time that's right. We're going to only introduce one at a time. And this helps to determine if they're allergic to anything. What is it? All right. Now, we only will offer a new food in a four-day to one-week period to help determine if they are okay with it. So, you don't get to feed little Timmy 
um, uh, let's just say you gave a little Timmy some green beans, okay, today at lunch. So then tomorrow, um, you gave little Timmy some apple slices. That's too close together of you introducing new foods. All right. Now let's talk about infant safety. We want to talk about car safety, like they need to be in those rear-facing car seats, in their car seat, in their uh, restraints, all right? Um, for infants younger than one year or less than 22 pounds, they need to be in rear-facing. We want to do things like prevent falls. We never leave a child unattended on a flat surface. Them things, them little babies, they just roll on off of all kind of stuff. We want to make sure that we have the crib rails raised and securely locked, you know. And we want to protect them from things like pools and protect them from things like stairwells. Um, and, you know, it has been noted that children have drowned in other people's pools. So even if you don't have a small child and you are an owner of a pool, you need to go ahead and safeguard your pool like if the little person was going to come and try to break into your house and they got into your pool. Like you need to safeguard your pool regardless if you have small children or not. Now, also, we want to do some toy safety. If any of these little toys, any of these little pieces can come apart, where can these pieces end up? In their mouth and in their trachea. And now you have to do the baby hymen maneuver. No, no. Or, or the worst thing, we're feeding these babies um, grapes, cut up hot dogs. Things like that that can get caught because they don't chew well or they just swallowing it or inhaling it, okay? We have to be careful with those things. So any toys that have removable parts, small parts, or they have an older sibling and the sibling has toys that may be age appropriate for them but not age appropriate for the baby, need to be kept up and away from the baby. Now, here's a summary of the major developmental changes with, uh, in the first year of life. They should double their weight by six months of age, and they should be tripled by one year of age. Their head circumference, a head and chest, are equal by one year of age. The maternal iron stores will decrease by age six months, so they need to be having their own iron intake. And the death perception begins to develop by nine months old. But you'll start seeing them earlier than that, like trying to gauge how to catch them on to something or get something because it's their depth perception that they're working on. Also, infants that are older than four months can voluntarily roll over. I have seen them younger doing that. And by age one year, infants can take some uh, independent steps. Uh, we have seen that much younger, you know. And primitive reflexes are replaced by voluntary movements as they age within their first year of life. They will have some tooth erupting at the age of six months when they might begin biting um, and they're not trying to harm you. But, you know, hey, when you're learning something new, you won't flex it, right? Y'all, y'all do it. Y'all learn something new in nursing school. What's the first thing y'all do? Y'all want to go tell somebody, educate somebody because you know so much. Because you do. Same thing with these little people. They figure out how to put that little index finger and that thumb together and they're going to pinch you because it's new. Or they figure out how to control a bite and then they bite you because it's new. Not to say that you let it be okay, but understand where they're coming from. They're coming from a place of new, 